Hey guys, welcome back to Schizone Lab 2. Once again in this series, we implement scientific computing programs from scratch in assembly. No libraries, no dependencies, no compiler, no linker, very bare bones. Um, there's two kind of parallel paths. One is the episodes where we actually implement the functions themselves. And then in these lab videos, we do live coding where I show you how to take those functions, integrate them together and make useful programs from scratch in like a live coding session. The topic today is finding multiple roots of a function and it should be pretty quick and easy. The ultimate question and answer to this video is find and plot all roots of sine of x between plus and minus 10. Here's the answer. We want to make a program that can solve that, um, give you the roots as well as make a nice pretty picture of sine of x and drop where the zeros are of that function. So pretty simple. Here's the expected output. Let's go ahead and do that. There are four steps for this. I kind of broke them down into parts as well as what examples, what episodes cover these topics. So you can go and copy and paste things from these examples to ultimately implement these steps. First one is to count the roots, which requires some basic 20 point math, as well as a, that's covered in the example seven, which was on, which was on fractions, as well as some trig. So obviously sine of x is a trig function. We covered that in example 16 on trigonometry. Um, step two was to allocate space for this vector that we're gonna make and fill it with the roots. So for that, we'll have to use our heap, which we implemented in example 11, and our root finding techniques, which is from the previous episode, episode 17. Finally, we wanna print out that vector like we did in example 10 and also make a scatter plot, which we covered in examples 14 and 15. So. Let's do that pretty quick intro. Let's get into the programming right away. So if you get the suppository, you download this, get clone, whatever you have to do, you will end up with, um, actually you'll end up with this. And when you run make bins, you will get this binary folder, which will give you some functions that you can use, including one function that enables you to make binaries executable. We're not using a compiler or a linker, so we have to use our own DIY function to do that. So this is what implements that. Um, all our code for these lab videos is in the lab directory. So if we go into the lab directory and see, I already implemented lab two, but we're gonna implement it again by copying the template. So we're gonna copy our template, which is just a bare bones assembly file to a lab two directory. Let's go to lab two and uh, let's show you what, you what we got in here. So we have just a assembly code listing a bare bones one as well as an uh, an executable script basically so the way this works is um let me just show you so that shell script runs nasm on our code includes some syscalls that are based on what os you're on linux or bsd and uh, then it takes that makes it executable sets that you know to work and then executes the binary this is a very quick like test shell script lets us to compile and run our program pretty quick. Um, then in that code assembly listing, it's a bare bones file. All it has is a bare bones elf header with uh, an exit command and the accommodations, accommodations for a print buffer, which is usually required. So if I run this, nothing happens. Um, we return to zero if you check. So it's a very simple program and it's uh, the, the minimal program, I would say. So let's, get into it. So the first thing you want to do is implement the the first step. So what was the first step? Let's go back and see. Count the number of roots. So what is the algorithm for this? Let me let me paste in the algorithm that I'm going to be using just like a as a comment. Here's the algorithm I want to use. I mentioned this last time. Basically what we do is to find roots, to find the find multiple roots, um, we start at a lower bound. So I want to do it. Start at a lower bound, record the sign of that location, increment by some step size until you change sign and count the number of sign changes that you have until you hit the upper bound. And that's how many roots you have, ideally, between those boundaries. So let's implement that. The first thing you have to do, though, is actually include the sign function. That's the goal, right? So let's grab the sign function. This is all copy and paste. So let's go to the example on trigonometry. Take the sine function right here. This is the include for the sine function. Let's just snag that. 
if I include this in my program, I will now have access to the sine function. Boom. Easy. Now, um, I want to wrap that because you'll see that I don't want to have to keep working with this. This, in, this function requires two inputs. It requires a x value for sine of x. It also requires the tolerance of the Taylor series approximation. So we have to give both those things. So let's make a wrapper function for sine of x. We'll call it func. And what I want it to be like is I want it to be a function that returns a double in x and m0. And it will take in a double in x and m0. And it will basically be a wrapper for sine of x. So how does this work? Well, ultimately we're going to call sine of x and we're going to return. But this takes input. So it takes an input, let's just do this, in x of m0, but that input is already passed in x of m0. So we can ignore this line completely. Instead, we need to pass the tolerance. So where's the tolerance? Well, I don't know where the tolerance is. Let's make a tolerance. At address tolerance, let's define a tolerance called tolerance, and it will be a 0 0.0001. How's that sound? Now, this function is only supposed to affect x of m0, not any other, any other register, so let's preserve those. So let's subtract from, let me check my pre-made, just to make sure I do it right. Um, subtract from RSP the number of bytes in the x of m register, 16, and then we'll move into the stack location, zero offset, the uh, value in x of m1. And then when we're done, we will undo that. So we'll move into x of m1, the value from the stack. And then we will add 16 back to the stack to realign this, to reposition the stack in the right spot. And yeah, that should be it. This is our wrapper function for sine of x. Very nice. Now the algorithm. How does this algorithm work? Well, let's think about this. We'll need a a loop. So let's make a, a loop of address or whatever, a label called count roots loop. And in this loop, we'll try to implement this algorithm. So let's make some stuff in the beginning. Let's, uh, first of all, let's move that function into RDI so we can access it in RDI as opposed to having to keep calling this wrapper function. We can just call the register RDI instead. It makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then let's make a, a variable or register for counting. So let's use RCX as a counter. Uh, that's, I'm not going to put comments here, it's a waste of time. Um, and uh, we will move into x of m3. Let's use that to track our x value across the function, the lower bound. So what's this loop going to be? Basically, we're going to increment by this step, checking the sign as we go until we change signs, and that will be a root. So let's, let's do that. So let's use rbx as a flag. So this is like a sign flag um, zero for positive, one for negative. And we'll keep tracking that until it's changed. Obviously, we're wasting 63 bits here, um, but fine, who cares, not me. So what we'll do is we will move into x and m zero, the, the value of x in x and m three. We're gonna call RDI, which is the wrapper function for sign. And now let's compare that value, so you know, now x of m0 contains sine of x. Compare that against the value of 0. But what is 0? We have to define 0. Also, we have to define our bounds. Let's define all that stuff right now. So what are the bounds? So let's say lower bounds, dq, negative 10. You have to put 0 0.0 to make it a float. Um, upper bound, dq, 10. Uh, say step dq, I don't know, 0 0.01, how's that sound? And then zero to compare against. There are other ways to check the sign of things, but this is the easiest in my opinion. So we'll dq 0, 0.0, that happens to just be all zeros, but it's okay, we'll define a, a value for that. So now we're gonna compare that against xmm zero. And the idea is if we are above or equal to that zero, then we're positive. So we'll say sign compared. So we'll leave RBX at zero because it's a positive number. 
Otherwise, we're going to increment our bx, which makes it negative. So that's fine. The caveat here is that we have to compare against the previous value of our bx. So we have to have that established. So let's just say that's in our dx. Just say that for now. We'll add that in later. So we're going to compare our bx against our dx. And if they are equal, that means there's no root found. Otherwise, there was a root found, in which case we're going to increment our cx. That means we're going to count that as a root. If the sign has changed, the number of roots has increased by one. So increment our, our, our cx. And now if there's no root found, um, let's, well, either way, we're going to save the previous, the current value of rbx in rdx. So move it to rdx, the value in rbx. And um, now we're going to just increment our, our, uh, our x value. So we're going to add the step size to x of m3. So add step to x of m3. And then we're going to compare if that has exceeded the um, upper bound. If it has, then um, we stop. So we'll say jump the lower equal to count roots loop. Now this should work. The, there's one caveat here is that well, what about in the first step? It turns out the way this is written in the first step, if the sign is negative, it will count that as a, as a root. So we have to basically define RDX going into this. How we're gonna do that is actually pretty simple. We're basically gonna take all this logic outside the loop. Um, yeah, basically like all this logic here outside the loop and have like a condition when we go in that RDX is already set up and we'll jump into the middle of that loop. So I'll show you how that works, how that works. So um, let's do that. XMM zero to three, call RDI, fine. Compare against zero. So now um, we will say init sign compared. No, no, screw that. Let's just jump right in to the middle of the of the function. We're just going to jump into here. No root found. Because yeah, that's fine. Jump no root found. So what this does basically is this enables us to start our our loop and immediately jump into here, meaning we won't be able to detect a root in the first step of our bound, but it's okay because we'll be able to detect, um, we won't miscount the number of roots by one, assuming the input was negative at that first location. So this will enable us to do that. Hopefully this will count the roots for us. So now at the end of this, RCX contains number of roots. How can we check that? Well, I could add a bunch of includes here to print out decimal numbers. We could do that. Or, you know, big brain, how about we just return that as a function, as the, as the program return value? So instead of this, let's move into, and you could do DIL, CL, or you can do RDI, R, RCX. This is simpler, so let's just do this. This is less bytes. Um, and then run this. Oops, what happened? I don't, oh, I don't have the executable. So let's go back. Let's uh, make, make all the bins. Now I have that bin directory. Now if I run this, still, what happened? No binary? Hold on. Oh, it just failed to, something was wrong. Um, oh, operand. So what did I do wrong? Line 82, let's check. 82, 82. Oh, I'm dumb. I have to add 16. So stupid. I'm an idiot. Now let's echo the return value seven. So are there seven roots between negative 10 and 10? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, there are seven roots. So we did that right. Now let me go back. This is done. Count the roots is done. What is the next step? to allocate space for and make a vector for those roots. Okay, how do we do that? Well, first we need a heap. So let's copy some stuff for a heap. Let us go back in the code and, and begin this. So the first thing in a heap 
is, let's go to see what a heap even is. I have a example on that, memory allocation example 11, alloc and free code. Let us see. First, we have to have a heap size defined. We'll do that. That also feeds into the, the size of the segment in memory. So we have to add that to this. A bunch of includes are required. Let's just snag these three includes to make a heap, to free a heap, and to free heap uh, chunks and allocate heap chunks. And then we also need this at the bottom, which is definition of the heap start address. So we'll talk about that right now. First, let's paste in that include before I forget right here. And actually, let's get rid of this one on heap free. Only norm is free memory. We don't do that around here. Um, now, heap size, let's define a heap size. Let's do the same size as the print buffer, 4K. Why not? Plenty of, plenty of RAM on this computer. Heap size, 4096. Let's add that to our segment. This is in the, um, when it's loaded, but it's not in the binary. So that's good. It doesn't waste 4K of memory on our hard drive. Plus heap size. And uh, we also need that at the very bottom. It doesn't have to be at the bottom. It's just a macro, so uh, whatever. It's like a, I'm not sure what that is even called. It's like a uh, assembler directive for NASM. It defines this in there. It could be anywhere in the code, but I put it down here because that's where the heap is located. You can see here the heap is defined to be after the print buffer, so I put the heap definition down here. So yeah, that makes a heap. Let us return this to what it was before, before I forget. I don't like returning values that are non-zero if I don't have to. Um, and yeah, so now we have a heap. Now let us initialize the heap, right? That was the first thing to do, if I recall correctly. Let me check the example. It was to initialize the heap like this, and then we had to allocate like this. Let's copy this into our program. What am I doing? I'm dumb. Put it right here. Initialize the heap. We don't want to print anything out. Don't need that. Don't need that. Don't need that. Um, so we have to put the number of bytes in RDI. So let's take them from RCX, multiply by eight or shift it right, shift it left, sorry, by three. So shift RDI by three. This will allocate eight times RCX bytes. And then let's save that in a register. So we'll move into, let's do R15, the value in RAX. Let's do it in two spots. Oops, let's do it in two spots because I want to be able to increment through this. So I'm going to save it in R15 and R19, and R9. So we will say um, save address to uh, eight by RCX by vector for roots in R9 and R15. Copy the same thing again, but this time I want to save it, and this is going to sound dumb, I want to save an empty one for the zeros later on, the actual value of zero. So we're going to say save it in R14. Uh, another seven times eight byte chunk. So like this, and the beauty of this is basically we don't have to redo this math right here, this move RDI, RCX, multiply by eight. We can ignore that because our calling convention is so nice that these function calls, heap alloc and whatever, they don't affect any registers that aren't return values. And so believe it or not, RDI is the same value as it was way back here. Even though we've called this function already, RDI is unaffected and I can guarantee that for all the functions that we have in the, in the code base. So this will allocate another eight by RCX bytes for the roots and it will save the address in R14. Great. Now, that gives us space. Now we have to actually populate that vector with values, right? We've got the space for it. Now you have to actually find the roots and populate the, the vector. So let's do that. How do we do that? Well, ultimately, it's the exactly the same logic as this. I'm going to snag this entire thing and just change a few things here and there. Copy that entire, you know, 20 lines, dump it here. 
But instead, this time, I'm not counting roots, I'm finding roots. So I don't care about RCX at all. Get rid of all everything to do with RCX, delete. And instead, if we, were, we would have incremented RCX to count a root, now I want to just find the root. So let's just find the root. So how do we do that? We need the bisection method. So let's go to our example 17. That was the one that covered the root finding algorithms, including the bisection method. And let's just snag the include really quick. Here's the include for the method. Copy. Let's go back in. And paste. This takes some inputs. What are they? Who knows? Let's just copy the actual implementation here. Right there. Bam. Copy. Here. Use by session method to compute to find root. All this is the same except for a couple things. So the tolerance is not in dot tolerance, it's in tolerance. Let's use the same tolerance as the one that we used for the sign function, the actual Taylor series tolerance. Let's use the same value, who, who cares? Now, the bounds of the method are not the same bounds as our total search. It's just the local bounds, right? We've, we've just changed signs where the previous value was negative, the current value is positive, there's a root in the middle somewhere. Let's find the root between those two things. And so the upper bound is actually x and m3, that's the current value of x and the previous value let's just say that's an x of m1 and we'll implement that later and the last thing is rdi we've already set who needs that line of code not me so we have to save x and m1 so let's do that so we will move the previous value of x and m3 into x and m1 right here before we increment that now one last thing i just copied that entire set of code it's gonna break. I can guarantee it's gonna break. Why? Because it's the same labels. So let's change all the labels to be twos. This way it's a new a new set of addresses. So let's change all these to two and uh, that will hopefully prevent any error messages from popping up. Okay. So now at this point, um, x and m zero should contain the root. Now we have to save the root. And remember we saved that address to the first root, that vector, was in both R9 and R15. We're going to use R9. So I'm going to say move SD into R9, the value in X and M0. And then I'm going to add R9, 8. So now we'll point to the next location in memory. And uh, yeah, that should be just fine. Okay, great. Um, so once we're done here, the vector of roots should be populated. How can we guarantee that? How can we check that? Well, let's print it out. So how do we print out matrices? Who knows? Not me, but I do know we did it before. So let's go to our matrix basics example. You can look at the names to guess where it would be. And I'm sure in here somewhere we printed out a an array of floats. Here's the function print array floats. Let's copy that. And let's paste it into our includes right here. And the beauty of this function is that it doesn't just print floats, but it also includes all the functions required to help print floats. All dependencies are in that tree, so do anything else. You don't need to have print buffer or print characters, any of that stuff. It's all dependency of this function, and so we can just come down here and print it out. So how do we print out a how do we print out a matrix? I have no idea. Let's just check. We did this. Copy, paste. Like I said before, programming is all copy and paste. So let's just copy and paste this. Print roots. Print the standard out. Where is the first address? That's in R15. How many rows? There is one row. How many columns? There's RCX columns. We didn't change that. RCX columns. R8, print float, five sig figs, fine. Last thing you have to do to print out stuff, you have to flush the print buffer. So we'll say call print buffer flush and leave the code. This should work. Let's see what happens. It might break. It did not break. So here you can see, let me run it again. Here you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven roots between negative 10 and 10. Is that correct? Does it match our expectation? It does match. Great. 
Now we've done the first step, the second step, and the third step. Last step is to make the scatter plot. How does that work? Like I said before, I have no idea, but I do know we did it before. We had a, a whole example on scatter plots, example 14. Example C was evaluating functions. Let's go in there and let's see what we had to do to print out a scatter plot. So we had a heap. We have to open and close the file. We have to run the scatter plot. And we had these two things here, evaluate parameters and linear space. They were functions that basically enabled us to um, evaluate sign from negative 10 to 10, the whole length of that range. So let's let's grab that. Don't need these, we already have these two functions for the heap. So let's just copy these functions into our includes. Really quick, up here. File open, file close, scatter plot. Sure. And how do we use those functions? Psh, beats me. Copy and paste. That's all it is. Let's copy that entire program into here. So how do we do this? Oh, we had some wrapper function. I'll talk about this in a minute. And how did we do this? We had the heap initialized. We allocated some arrays for the X and Y data for the sign function. We put a linear spacing in the X. We evaluated into the Y. Open the file or in the scatter plot. Close the file. Okay, great. Let's paste that in. Boom, done. Program done. Isn't that easy? What else? Well, this stuff calls a bunch of garbage. Um, we will we will change some of the stuff. So the first thing is, this is all fine. 101 values is fine. Who cares? That's, that's enough for me. Um, X param, we'll put that in in a second. Y param, fine. This is the linear space thing for the X parameter. Let's not use random numbers. Let, let's use the actual numbers. Let's use lower bound and upper bound. Lower bound, upper bound. And then the, oops, the function, let's make a new one. This is a special function. I'll talk about that in a second. Let's call it param func. We'll do that at the top in a minute. What else? This is all fine, that's all fine. Let's also, while we're at it, let's paste in the rest of the stuff. You can see here we have these data structures called plot structure, file name, you know, parameters, all these different labels that have nothing in the in the code. Let's paste those in. So let's do that. Take this, copy everything without regard for what it even is. Copy, copy, copy. Paste, paste, paste. This will plot something. I don't know what it's plotting, but it's plotting something. Here are the names of stuff. Here's some inputs. Let's change these things. Who needs this garbage? Two, three, negative two, not for us. Um, these are the parameters, that's fine. 101 values, that's fine. Um, file name, let's change that to be something else. Let's change that to be sign roots. Change the title, instead of that polynomial, let's change the title to be um, roots of sine of x, x label x, y label, why? Um, let's change quickly the, the the min and max for the scatter plot just so it plots nicely. Let's say negative 12 to 12. Let's say y values negative 3 to 2 because it's, it's sine, right? That fits between negative 2 and 2. We'll leave all this for now. We'll change this in a minute. Who cares about all this stuff? The data, um, let's leave all this. I'm just going to turn off the, the marker size and the bit for the marker. You can see here, these, uh, this byte is a bunch of flags. Bit zero is the markers, bit one is the lines. The rest of the bits are for other stuff. I'm gonna turn off the marker, so I'll say db0x02. Okay, now comes for the definition of that function. You can see here, we have that function right here, param func. This function is basically a function that is like what we have already. It's this, it's this sign function here, this wrapper, but it can't, affect any registers and it takes all its inputs in order from the stack. So let me show you. We called it param func and it uh, it took and re and re returned a value in XMM but it, it has to be in RSP plus eight um, because it's a single value. And the reason why this is the, is the case is so we can potentially have functions of mul multiple parameters 
you know, a multi-dimensional design space and have multiple return values. And so we use the stack as opposed to registers to handle that because you only have 16 registers. So if you use the stack, you can have infinite number of uh, inputs. So we'll say double RSP plus eight. So it's the same function. The difference is you have to not affect any registers and you have to take your input from RSP eight. So how does that work? Well, copy that, copy that. Um, we'll say zero, we'll say one, we'll add this to 16. Oops, don't want any typos. 16, make that a zero. Um, we have to take from XMM to XMM zero from RSP plus eight. Let me just quickly check to make sure that's the right move. I always mess up my move instructions. That is the right move instruction. Um, but it says RSP plus eight, but we just added 32 things to the stack. So it's actually 32 plus eight or 40. Sounds good to me. Lastly, you have to put that back onto the stack. And so we will move just that single quad word to RSP plus 40. Um, X and M zero. Is that correct? Let me check. Yeah, that's right to me. Um, so yeah, hold on. Let me change this up here to param func. Not that it matters. It's just a comment. Um, and this should work. Let's see what let's see what happens. I'm gonna run this. See what happens. Probably gonna have an error. Let's see. No error. We got a sign roots.svg. If I open that sign roots SVG, here it is. Here is a plot of sine of X between minus 10 and 10. There's some weird stuff going on with this. The reason why it's doing that is because it's trying to subtract two thirds from two thirds. It's getting very close to zero, but not quite. So we'll change that in a second. We'll make that look, look nicer. Um, I might change like the number of grid lines and stuff. Do that in a minute. Let's first put the actual dots where the zeros are. We already have this saved, so just a matter of implementing that in the scatter plot. So let's do that really quick. And let me duplicate this and uh, go back. So we have the suppository. Let's go back in the code. Now, this last um, structure we have called data, the first entry is it's actually a linked list. This entry points to the next data set in the linked list. So let's make another one, we'll call it roots. And let's create the roots data structure. It's gonna be a copy and paste of this one. Story of my life. This will be the last entry in the linked list. We'll call it a uh, null pointer there. This one is gonna be a little bit different. It's not going to have any um, lines, just, just gonna have a marker. So we'll say line size zero, marker size 10, I don't know. Um, let's make it no line color. Let's make it green, just, just for fun's sake. Let's put the flag on just for the marker. And number of elements is not 101. It's actually going to be seven, but we don't know that. If we change our function, it might change the number of elements. So let's not put a number in here. Let's populate this. So this function, it needs to contain an entry you can see here at 16. That's going to be the address of that memory that we allocated for the roots. So all the X values at offset 16, a quad word, offset 26, another quad word for the Y value. So it's going to be all zeros. Um, and then in 36, a double word. So half the size, so four bytes for number of elements. So that'll be seven, but we have to put that in there automatically. So let's do that really quick. How are we going to do that? Well, let's do that right before we print. Where's our first print? Right here. So let's populate that data structure with stuff. So, oops. Um, we're going to move into, I believe it was called roots. 16 was the offset. And it was the address of the X value. So that was an R15. The Y values was an R14, and that was the 26. And then the number of elements was 36, and that was supposed to be the number of elements and that was in RCX, but it was a double word, so half the size. And you could do that in different ways with assembly. I just like to say, move the 
four byte version that register into that slot. That's just the easiest way in my opinion. So this is basically to populate the roots data set structure. Okay, let's see what happens. If I run this, no error messages. That's insane. All right, um, let's open it up. What does it look like? Refresh this page, boom. This is some pretty big green dots. I'm not sure I like that big. Um, let me go through and change the formatting of this one to match more or less what I had in the example in uh, in this slide, but we'll keep green dots. I like green, let's just leave that as green. So let's go back to the code and let's just check the, the formatting of what I had in the example. So in the example, I had a little bit bigger plot, I believe, right? It was less zooming required. Yeah, it was 800 by 400, oops, did not type, 800 by 400, plot margins was 5, 12, 12, 2, 2, 0, 0, 0, F, 0, 0, I had 9 by 3, that makes it easier because you're dividing into two groups, so that makes it easier to um, subtract, so it won't have that 0, 0, 0, 0 thing, um, subdivisions per tick, what do I have, I have 2 and 2, really, fine, 2, 2, 2, 2, What's this? 32, five, come on, let me see. Let's scroll down. Font size for the labels was 24. Everything is obviously twice as big, basically. 16 for this one, um, five, five. Okay, it was double thickness for the majors, one for the minor stroke thickness um, on the grid. What were my uh, tick margins? It was 60 and 40. Flags was one and F. Um, Let's see how that looks. I'm down to run it. Oh, let's make this one a little bit bigger, this line bigness. Make it, so we're gonna make everything bigger. So if I run this, how does it look now? Run the code. I still have that same SVG. Let's open that in Firefox. Zoom out a little bit, boom. That is our roots of sine of x. So we found all the roots of sine of x. The plot looks very pretty, I like that. Um, so yeah, the, we're done. We finished everything. We've checked off all the boxes. Um, we've counted the roots, made some space for them, uh, made a vector of the roots, printed out the vector, and also made a scatter plot. So we integrated like, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six different examples. You could have done more. You could have made a nice um, report with all this from example 15. You could have done so much stuff. So I just want to show that it's, it's actually super easy. How long is this video? This video is only... 38 minutes long, and we've already been able to implement this entire program from scratch just by copying and pasting stuff from the Schizo and code base. So if that's cool to you, you have any questions, come to Discord, we have a server going, um, ask your question and we can hang out. With that, I'm done. I wanna thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. All right, see ya.